Greece is a very complicated place, and it's simple-minded to say that it's all about Shia versus Sunni and that the Shia will always line up with other Shia against other Sunnis. In truth, in 1991, I was with Secretary of State Baker on his first trip to the Middle East right after the Gulf War. This massive Shia rebellion had just started in southern Iraq. The U.S. was sitting on its hands and doing nothing, like Syria today, I'm afraid to say. We get to Riyadh, and the Saudi foreign minister and the Saudi ambassador to the United States plead with Baker to support the Shia rebellion. And I'm telling you something that you won't read in the history books, because most history books say the opposite. They say the Saudis, being Sunnis, didn't want us to support the Shia. It's not true. They said the most important thing is to get rid of Saddam Hussein. We're not afraid of these people. They said, for one thing, they're Arabs and not Persians. They fought loyally for Iraq for eight years against the Persian Shia. They're not about to be governed from Tehran. Let's go fast forward to 2007. Maliki, who's still the prime minister of Iraq, and I'm not, I have my reservations about Maliki, but the notion that Maliki is, is a puppet in the hands of the Iranians is just not true. In, 19, in 2007, I'm sorry, 2007, he sent his army down to Basra to suppress the Shia militia of Muqtada Sadr. Against American advice, he went ahead and did it. Fortunately, the American army was there to bail him out because he was a little overextended. But he took on the Shia clients of Iran. Two years later, 2009, there's some uh, suicide bombings, three major suicide bombings in Baghdad, and a fourth one that may have been aimed at Maliki that was intercepted. And Maliki accused former Saddam loyalists based in Damascus of being responsible for these bombings and demanded that the Syrians hand them over. The Syrians refused. Maliki came to the U.S. for help. 2009, the U.S. was busy trying to improve relations with Bashar al-Assad. We said, we're not going to take sides in this argument between Iraq and Iran. And then, two years later, we take all of our military out of Iraq, including our Air Force, and then we're surprised when Maliki refuses to confront the Iranians over overflying Iraq to send weapons to Syria, when he has no ability to stop it even if he wanted to. And in any case, he's in a very dangerous neighborhood where Iran is now the big bully and the U.S. is gone. And I'm sorry, it's a sort of a long way of saying, it's a famous saying about the Middle East, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. There was a great historian of the Middle East, an Arab named Albert Harani, who was a professor here at Oxford, who elaborated on that in a very intelligent way, basically saying, it's true, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, but you also have to understand the principal enemy at 9 o'clock in the morning isn't necessarily the principal enemy at 5 o'clock in the evening. That's actually not just true of the Middle East. It's true of most places where politics is a game of life and death. And I think we have altered Maliki's calculations in a very harmful way by having him feel abandoned and by having disengaged as much as we did. I'm sorry it's a long answer, but I think there is as much, even between Iraqi Shia, as much differences as there are natural affinities. And one of the reasons to be engaged with Iraq is to take advantage of the fact that Iraqis really do not want to be dictated to from Tehran. And if we assume that they do, we're making a fatal mistake. <laughs>